Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimble Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. For today's show, the last in our Train AI series, I'm joined by Ghazale Mir Sharif, a machine learning scientist working on computer vision at Figure 8. Ghazale and I caught up at the Train AI conference to discuss a couple of the projects she's worked on in that field, namely her research into the classification of retinal images and her work on parking sign detection from Google Street View images. The former, which attempted to diagnose diseases like diabetic retinopathy using retinal scans, is similar to the work I spoke with Ryan Poplin about on Twimble Talk 122. In my conversation with Ghazale, we focus on how she built her data sets for each of these projects and some of the key lessons she's learned along the way. If you've been following this series, you've heard me thank Figure 8 for their support and sponsorship. But have you taken a moment to check them out at figure-8.com yet? If not, you should. They provide the essential human-in-the-loop AI platform for data science and machine learning teams, which trains, tests, and tunes machine learning models to make AI work in the real world. Finally, we're celebrating the second anniversary of the podcast this week. Have you found this podcast useful? If so, we want to hear how. Submit your written comments via our anniversary page at twimmel.ai slash 2AV or leave us a voicemail at 636-735-3658. Again, the second anniversary page is at twimmel.ai slash 2AV. A quick note before we jump in, this episode was recorded live on site at the Train AI conference, so there is some unavoidable background noise. All right, everyone, I'm here with Ghazale Mir Sharif. Ghazale is a machine learning scientist in computer vision at Figure 8. And we are here, uh, as you can tell perhaps by the background noise, at the Figure 8 Train AI conference in San Francisco. Ghazale, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. Thank you. I'm excited about being here. Uh, I am as well. You know, it's the tradition on the podcast to have guests start out by introducing themselves and talking about how they got interested and started in machine learning and AI. What's your story? Sure. So I'm currently a machine learning scientist uh, with the focus in computer vision, uh, figure eight. So I completed my PhD in computer science uh, last summer. And before that, I did my master in Iran in artificial intelligence. Uh, then I applied for the PhD program in the United States and came here for uh, school. Okay. Uh, so my focus was mainly computer vision, and I have worked on uh, different topics and application of computer vision in different areas, which I really enjoyed so far. And I uh, decided that I wanted to do the same uh, by joining the industry. Uh, so that's <laughs> where I'm, I'm here and now. What initially sparked your interest in computer vision? How did you choose that as a field uh, to study in grad school? Yeah. When I was an undergrad student, I uh, met this uh, professor in one of uh, uh, the master program at a university in my hometown. So he was uh, doing research on a medical project uh, on like a detection of diseases uh, using the retinal images. That it really, uh, I was, I got really interested in that research, and I talked to him and uh, started to learn about that project. Then I applied for the master program and, and got into the artificial intelligence uh, program in Iran. And I decided that uh, after taking courses on image processing and computer vision, uh, I decided that uh, this is the area that I really like to be in, uh, and uh, I uh, like to learn how I can apply AI and computer vision. Uh, to help uh, in different topics like medical uh, project, which is really my uh, interest. And I have uh, uh, experience in medical image processing. So uh, that's where like, I decided to, I want to work on my thesis on this topic. And I got back to that uh, professor uh, and uh, I collaborated with him on this particular project and did my thesis on that uh, 
so that, that's how it all started. Okay, okay. And so what was your thesis on? My thesis was on um, classification of retinal images, retinal vessels in retinal images into arteries and veins. So uh, this is uh, still one of the uh, latest topics uh, in medical uh, image processing that uh, uh, because uh, retinal, uh, retinal uh, vessels, they are, it can be indicative of uh, eye diseases, uh, prevalent eye diseases like uh, diabetic retinopathy, which is the leading cause of blindness. Um, so any alternation changes in the vessels uh, could be uh, early indicative of this, such, such diseases. So we had uh, this data uh, that collected from patients, from these retinal images, and we wanted to process the data and classify the vessels into arteries and veins, and then measure the width of vessels and uh, vein, uh, vessels like arteries and veins, and based on the ratio and comparing it to a, a normal, uh, like this uh, normal ratio in patients. Uh, to see uh, if we can detect uh, these such diseases at their earlier stages. Uh, so this was one of the topics that I work on. So I basically work on classification of vessels into arteries and veins to help with um, doing some measurements that can help predict such diseases at earlier stages and uh, hopefully prevent uh, blindness uh, by detecting this at earlier stages. Interesting. So not too long ago, I did an interview with Ryan Poplin, who's a research scientist at Google, who recently had some work published around starting from, I'm assuming, similar types of retinal scans, retinal fundus scans. And from that determining uh, all kinds of um, demographic types of information or uh, indicators like you know, whether, whether it was a male or a female or uh, their age, things like that from these retinal images. Apparently, we can learn a lot from the eyes in addition to just kind of preventing eye health. Yeah, I heard about that. Actually, uh, yeah, I saw that. And uh, I know like they are uh, looking at the West Cell networks in uh, images for females and for males. And uh, there are some differences that the uh, uh, they can, using uh, computer vision and artificial intelligence, they are now able to uh, extract those patterns from the images and, and understand uh, like the small uh, changes and find uh, like this, could, this network could belong to a female or male, which is really hard to do by a human eye. By, right. uh, so... Uh, so for your research, how did you how did you get started? Did you I'm assuming or did you did you inherit some training data set that you uh, that was already labeled that uh, you could just start working on? Or did you have to build that up from scratch? Yeah, that's a good question. Like uh, without training data, we really uh, kind of go anywhere. Like that's the first a step to uh, do a research is collecting data and ensuring that the data has uh, uh, the data is clean and uh, has the well labels. Mm -hmm. And then uh, once you have enough data, you can uh, start training the models and then improving a model by collecting more data. So a lot of time uh, research are uh, stuck at, at the first stage because uh, that is uh, like time consuming and hard process, especially for uh, medical image annotations. It needs some expertise uh, to label and annotate medical images. So we collect that uh, ima uh, those images from a uh, hospital, an eye hospital in my hometown. Uh, we collaborated with a, a doctor and a team of doctors that were monitoring the research. And then we used some online uh, data sets that were publicly available uh, with the labels, uh, which uh, have helped me to uh, like uh, do the research. Uh, but now currently I'm a figure eight and providing training data is much easier. Uh, and I think the research goes much faster for me here. Uh -huh. uh, so when you, so you, you had uh, the collaborations with the hospital to provide access to training data. How did you, how did the project evolve? What were, were the key steps for you? The key step, uh, like collecting the images are a hard process. Like it, Medical images are collected in hospitals uh, and using devices that can be expensive. Uh, and like uh, we learned from the doctors how to label that data uh, and then uh, they monitor the research. So make sure that 
uh, we have the ground truth data that we can develop our model and validate our model. Uh, and then once we build that data, uh, we uh, started like by uh, looking through the um, computer vision methods that uh, could be uh, uh, exploited to uh, further this research. So I started reading papers, the literature people have done, the work that people already have done, and decided that this uh, after like uh, validating and testing different models, I decided that these particular kind of features are giving me uh, good accuracy on these images for this type of task. And then uh, I write the paper <laughs> and publish. <laughs> what were some of the models that you explored? Uh, uh, the, the model I used was uh, some traditional model. At that time that I was doing that research, it, it was like uh, maybe six or seven years ago. Uh, so the advancement in uh, deep learning uh, still weren't like at this stage. So I used some traditional models, uh, computer vision models, some uh, classifiers like uh, LDA method to uh, like we did uh, feature extraction from the vessels, arteries and veins are different in color. Uh, and because uh, like uh, arteries uh, carry the blood with oxygen, so they are brighter than veins, veins are darker. So from the pixel intensities, we could uh, extract some features from the profile of vessels that could be uh, differentiate the vessels uh, from each other. And then uh, there is a, this a specific uh, structure in the vessel network that uh, is like a, a tree that every vessel branches into two other uh, vessels. And then Arteries and veins uh, never cross the same type of vessels, but arteries can cross veins. So if you have an uh, intersection of arteries and veins, you know that one of them is artery and the other one should be vein. So using such information, we, ha we improved the method and correct the vessels that were uh, not uh, returned as uh, the correct labels by the model. And we improved the model. Oh, interesting. And what were the key lessons learned that you discovered through this process that you have continued to use in your work today? Yeah, uh, at that time, like I said, there, uh, there weren't that much training data, so we used some traditional models. And uh, once you expand your research to like more images, you validate on more images, then uh, you see that like you can uh, exploit, uh, for example, at uh, this time there are deep learning models that they use a lot of training data and can uh, do such tasks uh, more accurately uh, classifying the vessels. And then if we can classify uh, the vessels correctly, more accurately, then we can uh, do these measurements, small measurements in the uh, veins and arteries separately and uh, help with in indicate, like uh, help with the uh, early detection of these diseases. So uh, that I learned that uh, at this time, like uh, I really like to uh, go back to that research again and provide more training data uh, and uh, like uh, improve uh, my model, use more uh, advanced deep learning models to do that. I know that Deep DeepMind, uh, Google DeepMind are already doing a lot on this, and uh, uh, this is uh, still an ongoing re uh, research because uh, diabetic retinopathy is a prevalent uh, disease that is causing the leading cause of blindness in the world, and uh, this research could really help uh, to prevent that. Uh, I learned in, from the conversation with uh, Ryan that there are a number of public data sets of retinal images. Did you use any of those? Yeah, there are coming like more and more data sets now. People, uh, it, it, I think it's really good to share data that uh, research can, uh, uh, we can further the research. But a lot of time uh, we cannot really share medical data because it contains personal data and right. uh, it's hard to collect that data. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's good to know. Like, uh, it, it's a research that I have done like a few years ago, but, uh, I really like to get back uh, on that and see more of the data sets that are available now. And, uh, uh, we can use our current, uh, AI human in the loop platform to get uh, more labels and uh, further the research. What are some of the things you're working on nowadays? 
Yeah, I'm currently working on this project, uh, parking sign detection, uh, which uh, I've heard about. This. I'm really I think excited Rob about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm working on this with my uh, coworkers, uh, Dr. Humayun Ershad, and uh, it it happens like when when I uh, came to San Francisco uh, for work uh, during the summer. Uh, I shipped my car from uh, Houston. It was during the Hurricane Harvey in Houston. So I really didn't have uh, that time to explore how how uh, tough driving can be here uh, in San Francisco. <laughs> so I started driving, and in the first couple of months, I got a lot of parking tickets. <laughs> and I started using this app uh, called Spot Angel. Uh, Spot Angel. Angels. Yes. Okay. Uh, like uh, the app helps you based on the GPS information on your car. Uh, like can say like your, what is your current location, and then based on the parking regulation applied to curbs, uh, can send you a notification on when you need to move your car, for example, not to get a ticket for a street cleaning, because uh, that's something I forget a lot, <laughs> and. I remember about that app and I installed the app and uh, that really saved me uh, many times from getting tickets. So I decided that I want to uh, work on this research because this is something we started last year when I was doing an internship in Spot Angels uh, by detecting parking signs, finding the location of uh, parking signs, uh, the actual location on the map. And uh, like uh, extracting a parking regulation uh, that is assigned to each curb, uh, digitizing such information can help then with uh, uh, helping with the drivers to have a less stressful uh, experience driving in cities like San Francisco, mm. uh, including myself. <laughs> so I'm kind of so like helping you... myself with this research too. Uh... So if, if Spot Angel exists and does this, what are you trying to accomplish uh, with the research that's that's different? Yeah, Spot Angels have been uh, going through the street level images, uh, uh, Google Street View or images that uh, their user can collect. Uh, and then they have been going through this uh, images uh, manually and uh, extracting the parking regulation. This is a really time consuming uh, process and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's co costly. So computer vision models can help to extract a lot of those information uh, in an automated way. Um, so that's uh, what I uh, was doing there, and now we are extending the research uh, by using deep learning models, by providing more training data uh, on parking signs in San Francisco, and then we're hoping to build more accurate uh, models uh, to, to then uh, read, the, uh, read the text on the parking sign and extract the uh, parking rules. Um, it, have you found the getting access to the Google Street View data difficult, or is that freely available? Uh, Google uh, Street View is a public data set, so you can go and see the uh, Street uh, View uh, images, but to download them uh, and publicly uh, release the, that, then you need to uh, talk with uh, the providers of the data. So since we are doing this research and we uh, contacted them and we, uh, uh, they are, uh, they uh, are allowed us to uh, release this data and use for this research because this would be a research that I'm sure a lot of people would benefit from because uh, uh, especially people who are driving in cities like San Francisco or New York, they know how hard it uh, could be. Like, yeah, it, we, we can have a safer environment by helping the drivers finding uh, parking uh, spots or like uh, understanding the regulations faster. So yeah, we have that data now and then we're providing a training data uh, on top of that building uh, more accurate uh, model. What kinds of techniques have you had to use to, to make this research work? Yeah, like every other research, the first uh, step was uh, training data. Uh, we actually uh, announced that that data set we, that we used uh, for the initial training of the model uh, is released now publicly. Uh, mm -hmm. So everybody can uh, go and uh, try, uh, like build their models on that and, and test it. Uh, so uh, we use uh, our figure eight uh, AI human in the loop platform to uh, 
uh, label the data that we collected from Google Street View imagery. And then we tested different deep learning models such as SSD and YOLO model uh, and saw the results. Uh, and then using different round of active learnings, uh, we trained the, retrained the model several times and uh, fit new data to the model uh, and improve the model. So currently, like we can uh, detect parking sign uh, in the images with uh, like accuracy more than 90% and with very low false positive rate. And we're hoping that we can extend this to other cities, other dense areas, such as Los Angeles, New York, San Diego, uh, to uh, using transfer learning models to uh, extend this model to those cities. Awesome. And uh, to wrap things up, what advice would you have for someone who wants to take on a project like this? What advice? Um, whenever I start a project uh, I, uh, like this, like for me, like uh, when I was doing research in uh, university, a hard part was that like uh, a lot of time you're uh, spending a lot of time on uh, creating and labeling the data like uh like having access to data is not that easy. And mm -hmm. a lot of researchers are stuck in that step to build their models. I found that in industry, like by providing more training data, I can build much uh, like accurate, more accurate models uh, much faster. So when I learned about this, like uh, I um, could build models faster. So it's, it's good that uh, when people start a research, they... Uh, explore the uh, resources that uh, could be available to them to like uh, the models that are already available like what data are publicly available or uh, how they can uh, access more data to like further further research great i think uh, that's that's good to know <laughs> awesome awesome well gazala thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us thank you for having me here thank you All right, everyone, that's our show for today. For more information on Kazale or any of the topics covered in this episode, head on over to twimlai.com slash talk slash 144. Thanks again to Figure 8 for their sponsorship of this show and the Train AI series. To follow along with the entire series, visit twimlai.com slash train AI 2018. And show some love for this podcast's second anniversary and share how it's been helpful to you over at twimlai.com slash 2AV. Thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.